Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Matt Stewart. <laughs> Attention, sports fans. Welcome to the library. <laughs> I'm Ann Knegendorf. I'm a writer and editor here, and we are all so glad to see you tonight. Um, <laughs> sorry, Matt. <laughs> now I feel like I interrupted you. You did, but it's okay. <laughs> so before we start the event, I'd like to um, point out a few programs we have coming up. On April 9th, so that's next Tuesday, we have a military historian from the Command and Center the Command and General Staff College in Leavenworth coming to talk to us about Guadalcanal. Um, that's the first, where the first major land offensive by Allied forces against the Empire of Japan was in World War II. On April 11th, please mark your calendars to go to the Plaza Branch to hear Melissa Ferrer Seville, Kansas City's first poet laureate, interview poet Taylor Bias, whose book called I Done Clicked My Heels Three Times won the 2023 Maya Angelou Book Award. Um, that award is a national award and a really big deal um, and was started by the Kansas City Public Library, UMKC, and five other Missouri universities to recognize work that has a strong commitment to social justice. And also on April 19th, back here downstairs in Kirk Hall, we will be celebrating this building's 20th anniversary, the 20th birthday of the library in this building. Uh, this building was built in 1906 and first housed the first national bank, and 20 years ago it became the library. So we'll have a party with jazz and refreshments and crafts and all sorts of, sorts of things on April 19th. So tonight we are excited to host this conversation between Frank White and Matt Stewart. Matt has reported the news in Kansas City for 20 years and is the author of five books, including Unique Eats and Eateries of Kansas City, and this is his second appearance at the library. Frank White Jr. has served as Jackson County Executive since 2016. He calls himself a proud product of Kansas City's East Side, where he attended Lincoln High School and learned to love baseball. Frank played for the Kansas City Royals for 18 years, earned eight gold gloves, and made five all-star appearances, solidifying a spot in the Royals Hall of Fame. A high point of that career, of course, was helping the, the Royals win the World Series in 1985. I remember that very, very well. He was also the first second baseman to hit cleanup in all seven games in a World Series since Jackie Robinson. And yes, tomorrow is the vote on the stadium tax. We all know that's on lots of people's minds. Um, but tonight we're talking about baseball and we're talking about the history of the Royals and Matt's book. We'll have time afterward to talk um, about, you know, maybe a couple other things, but we mainly want to stick with um, baseball and Matt's book. <laughs> Um, so when we do go to audience Q&A, we'll have microphones up here at the front, and we ask that for the people listening at home, you come all the way up to the microphone, and we also ask that whatever you say end in a question mark. So I'm going to hand it over to Matt now. Ready to go, Matt? Ready to go. All right. Thank you Can't all for being here. It. All right. Hey, thank you. Uh, well, yeah, round of applause for Anne. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for all of you braving the storms coming out here tonight. Uh, you are in for a treat. Um, I've been looking forward to this ever since I asked Frank back in November. I said, hey, I'm doing something at the Kansas City Library. I want you to be there. And right away, Frank's like, let's do it. Um, and I'm excited because I grew up a Royals fan. Now, I didn't I wasn't born until 1975, so Frank was already a couple of years into his career. Uh, but, you know, back in the mid-80s until he retired in 1990, I mean, I was watching him uh, any chance I could, uh, listening to Denny Matthews on the radio call those games, and I just, I, I've been a huge Royals fan my entire life. That's why I wrote this book, The Kansas City Royals and Illustrated Timeline, and it's kind of my love letter to the Royals, talking about the entire history of the team. And, of course, you got to have Frank White in there, and so I went ahead, and this is his page. Uh, basically, I had 500 words to tell his whole life story. <laughs> I'm like, it's not enough words, but I got, I got the highlights in there. And then I figured we would talk more tonight about 
Frank's career, and I love the insight. Um, anytime I talk to Frank, I love his insight. So I'm excited for you guys to hear uh, what it was like being a major league player, what it was like for him, uh, really coming out of the academy, right? Like yes, uh-huh. the first product out of the Royals Academy to uh, make it to the major leagues. So you can see right there, there's Frank, uh, played from 1973 to 1990. And Frank, I want to start really at the beginning of it all. Uh, when did you first pick up a glove? How did you learn how to play baseball? Well, I learned from my dad. We, he was a, a amateur player. He loved baseball. We'd go to the park on Sundays and, and play catch, and he hit us fly balls and ground balls, and we'd go into Ole Municipal Stadium on Sunday, the only time we go in the stadium. Uh, so we, and, and really the, the bulk of my learning just came from playing Sandlot. You know, when our folks went to work, we just went to the park and just started playing. You know, we didn't have no formal coaching. Uh, uh, we just started, uh, we didn't have uh, what they have now. is like we didn't have coach pitch or machine pitch or t-ball or anything like that. We just started hitting each other right away. You know, we had no formal training. And that's how we learned to play the game. Did you keep score? Nope. <laughs> just, just get up there and hit just, and run just, the bases? So, uh, and hitting and running, that's for sure. Just having fun. Yeah. So as you got older, you started getting on some teams. Um, but your high school, Lincoln High, you didn't have a baseball team, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, I started uh, when I was nine, my first formal uh, entry to plan on, on a team and between nine and I think I was 12 and my dad put I was on this team that was a pretty good team I wasn't playing very much and and my dad after the third game my dad whenever I was pitching in the game he was he was he's gonna get kicked out you know he was <laughs> he wasn't gonna stay he, he's gonna and he'd go sit in your car or whatever but it's just too intense he just yeah but when I was playing he was okay for some reason but but it, but I, after the third game I hadn't played and so in the, in the third game, he just came and just grabbed me by my jersey and pulled me off the bench, and, and I'm kicking and screaming, and, and he's taking them. He, he said, we're getting out of here. So I got home and kind of let things cool down a little bit, and I finally went to him, and I said, you know, why'd you take me off the team? He said, do you like baseball? I said, yeah. And he said, do you understand baseball? And being 12, you know, I said, yeah. I, you know, I thought I did. You know, I'm on the bench just rooting for everybody else. But uh, then he said, well, tell me how you can understand baseball. And, and, how, and how you can like baseball when you don't play. And I didn't have an answer for him. And so he put me on another team that didn't, wasn't very good, but I played every day. Uh, I got an idea of what this game was all about, and, and that really got, got me kick-started. And then when I was 14, that's when I really played my m- most aggressive, good, good player-type teams and, and, and league. And, and I was playing for Hallmark Cards, which is, which is Deborah's dad, was my coach. And... We won the championship when I, when I was 14, and, and I always played older. I played 14 to 18, and, and so I was always playing with older guys all the time. And then when I was 18, I was playing in the Ben Johnson League, and that's all college guys. So I always was challenged by playing against older guys, and that's how I got excited about the, about the game. At the time, did you know how good you were? I knew I was a good athlete. Uh, I played basketball, football, bas- and baseball, and, uh, but I didn't know what it took to get to that level. And I didn't know, you hear about bonus babies and uh, scouts coming and signing guys to big contracts. You hear all that stuff, but you don't, you don't know what it's all about. And I was, ni- I was 19, hadn't had talked to a scout, hadn't got any prospects of being drafted. And I was playing for uh, Hilton Smith. He was the uh, Hall of Famer, uh, Negro League Hall of Famer. He was my last uh, amateur coach. And he said, you need to go try for the Royals Baseball Academy, this experimental baseball academy that they were starting. And so I went to my boss, asked for two days off. Now, where were you, where were you working at the I time? was working at uh, Melville's Protection Plating Company. It's right there on the corner of 15th and Chestnut. What were you doing? Still there. Were you, like, cutting metal and stuff? No, I was uh, driving a forklift, and I was, uh, you know, when you, when you have these, well, an anodizing company is like when you take storm doors and, Rather than having them uh, silver, you bronze them and you turn it in summer black and things like that. So they have all these different acid pits. And so they have, so you have to take these strips of uh, sheet metal and you have to tie them to these poles and then they pick them up on a hoist. Then they take them and they dip them. Where are they, they going to dip them? Then you just keep it going. But mainly just doing that plus driving a forklift and moving stock around, stuff like so that. So this was your, so you had graduated high school. Mm-hmm. You were, were you married at the time? Yes. Uh-huh. You had a child mm-hmm. and you were just working. Right. And baseball was like, you're well, done. You, you basically yeah. thought you were probably done with baseball. I mean, yeah, because, you know, you're 19 years old at that point, and, and no one has recognized you as a, a top athlete or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, most of the guys that, 
didn't go from high school to playing basketball in college or football in college. Baseball really wasn't that avenue to go to college, but uh, I couldn't afford to go to college, so baseball was what I was left, left to play with. It's interesting, so Ewing Coffin, when he bought the Royals um, in 1968, and then he brought, you know, the first season was 1969 here in Kansas City at Municipal Stadium. And initially, you know, he, Ewing Coffin was very competitive. He wanted to win at whatever cost, and so he, thought he could just buy the best players off all the other teams. And of course, all the other owners are like, no, 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 these are our players. You can't just take them. And so he's like, well, how do I get great players for the Royals? And so he's like, okay, we're going to start a baseball academy. He sunk in millions of his own money into building a, an academy down in Florida. And all the other owners thought it was folly. They thought, they were, what are you doing? And he's like, well, if I can't buy your players, I'm going to make my own athletes. And then he decided to have tryouts across the entire country as far as trying to pinpoint the best athletes, the ones with the most potential, maybe some inner city kids, east side kids who didn't necessarily have a baseball team on their high school, but they had some training, they were really good. And so he started doing tryouts all over the country. Mm -hmm. They had a tryout here in Kansas City and that's where you came in. You went to the, but you, at first you weren't gonna go to the tryout or you weren't sure if you were gonna go. Well, I didn't know if I'd get off work, but. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, when, I, when he told me I could go, the first day I went down to Municipal Stadium, it was like 300 boys, and I had no idea what I was doing. So you just say, well, you go over here, we're going to run over here, we're going to throw over here, we're going to catch over here, we're going to hit over here. So people just tell me what to do. Then after the first day was done, then I thought I was done, then they said, we want you to come back the next day. And, and we did a lot of um, stuff like, uh, here's a deck of cards, you know, put all the black cards on black cards, red cards on red cards, how fast can you do it, that kind of stuff. Interesting. So it was a lot of that stuff going on. And then after that, it was like, okay, we want you to go to this baseball academy. And I'm saying, well, you know, I don't know. You know, at this point, I just didn't know. And then uh, one day, uh, uh, Mr. Kaufman's chauffeur came up to the house and had a big blue limo and pulled in my neighborhood. Everybody's going to come out and check it out. But <laughs> yeah. So, and so uh, he gets out and he comes and he says, well, Mr. K wants to talk to you. And I said, well, where is he? He said, he's in the car. I said, okay. So I go down to the car and open the door and he's not there. I said, well, where is he? He says, well, he's on the car phone. I had no, I didn't know what a car phone was, you know, back in those days. <laughs> right. So I get in, I'm talking to him and he says, well, I want you to, uh, you know, because the, the rules originally was no married, no married guys. And so he said, well, I want you to go to the school for me. And I said, well, okay, being, being married and making $100 a week, and he said, so how much does it pay? And he said, it pays $50 a month plus room and board. And you get a chance to go to school in the morning and baseball in the afternoon. And I said, ah, that's not gonna work, I, I can't do this. I said, uh, what's my family gonna do? And so finally, we just, to make a long story short, you know, we just, he gave my wife a job at the, at the stadium in the ticket office. She moved in with my parents, and then I went to uh, Florida, and, and that's how it started. Wow. So he brings this limo, you're talking on a phone that you never even knew there were phones in cars. No. He no. invites you to this academy, you finally make that decision. And so, when did you go down? Was it in the fall, or did they, did, was the academy in the spring? When was the okay, academy? Okay, the trial was June of 1970, so we followed the, uh, the college schedule. So we started, we started when colleges started up, like August. Okay. And then we uh, would, would take breaks when colleges take breaks and come home, like Thanksgiving for Christmas. And then we go back in January. That, 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 that's the schedule we followed. So we. We had to get up at six in the morning and eat breakfast and get on a bus, go to junior college, come back at noon, eat lunch, and it's baseball all afternoon until five. Then 5.30 we have dinner, then you have an hour and a half study hall, then lights out, get ready for the next day. But since I was uh, uh, poor, <laughs> and, I, and, it, and you, you had to figure out how to communicate at home, so I would come back, so we were, we were self-contained. We, we had a 50-room dorm, uh, we had our own uh, complex, five-field five, five field complex, we had our own uh, cafeteria, Marson Cafeteria was our cafeteria, we had our own lock group, so we were self-contained. Yeah. And so after I did the study hall, then I go back to the cafeteria, and then I wash dishes for... Uh, to make money? To make money to call. Oh, See, okay. I had headed down to make a three-minute phone call uh, oh, long distance. Long distance right. phone Right, no call. free long distance yeah. back so, then. So you had, to, you had to figure out how much it cost for you, to, you to talk for three minutes. So you, so you get all your questions. <laughs> so you'd wash enough dishes to pay for the phone call to call your wife and right. see how things are going right. back so, home. So that was, that's what it boiled down to. Was, uh, that's the only way you're going to communicate. So I said, well, we've got three minutes. So 
Uh, we just write your questions down, and you don't do any crazy talk. You just say, okay, boom, 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 and then talk to you tomorrow. Wow. So that's, kind of, that's how it went, yeah. Now, you guys played games against other, like, minor league teams. Is that correct, from other organizations? Uh, not the first year. The first year, we played against colleges and universities. Okay. Uh, and then once you get to, uh, oh, this was like June, July. This is August. So when you get to the spring, you go through spring training. And then you get to the season. So that, that first season of rookie ball is when you start playing against uh, other, other teams. professionals. And you may play against some of them uh, during spring training. You guys were playing pretty well. Yeah. You that, win a lot that, of games. That, that, yeah, we were like 93 and 31 against colleges and universities. That's uh, pretty that good. first year. Then, yeah. we, then we went to rookie ball, and we, uh, we won rookie ball. Uh, we were like, oh, God, I'm trying to think. We only lost 13 games. Uh, in that rookie season, 60-game rookie, rookie season. Then we was finished second in instructional league. And then we went home, and then we came back the next spring. And that's when you had to make – you had to try for one of our minor league teams at that point. Okay. And that's when guys got getting – you know, they either went to other teams or or just – didn't make, didn't make it at the, from that standpoint. Though. But you were telling me earlier that the ability to play six days a week, you know, in a structured format really helped you grow as a player. Well, I think it was more the fundamentals. I mean, I think athletically I was good. It just said fundamentally I wasn't good in terms of knowing all the positions, all the things that it required to play that position. And so when I got signed, I was an outfielder. And then our first in a squad game, we didn't have a third baseman. So in amateur ball, you play everywhere. So I said, I'll play third. So I went and played third, and then I played third for like six months. And then I went to shortstop. And I actually came through the minors, all the way through the minors as a shortstop. Wow. And then when I got to the major leagues, uh, I looked around, and, and Cookie was older than Freddie. And I said, well, I'd be allowed to play second base. So, <laughs> so, so that's when I started learning how to play second base at that point. So if we move forward real quick, I think this is, this is one of my favorite stories. Is the fact, well, here's the Royals Baseball Academy. Um, so there's kind of a picture from a newspaper of the instructional that you guys were getting. And they were doing things in the, in the baseball academy that no major league team had really done before. Mm -hmm. uh, batting practice every day, which yeah. apparently at the time wasn't necessarily something that yeah, the major league was It was, was either batting doing. practice every day and intra-squad games between ourselves every day. Um, it was intense, they, it sounds they, like. They would bring in athletes uh, to, to, to tell us how they became successful. Like they would bring in... Amos Otis and Cookie Rojas and John Mayberry, Ted Williams. Oh. Uh, they would bring in uh, Jim Lemon, the guys that were. Uh, so we had, a, we had a professional staff, you know, from manager to trainers all the way down. And so they would bring all these people in just to uh, uh, show us all the fine, uh, the fine things about hitting and, and fielding and things like that. So, and then they would leave. Then the coaching staff would drill us you know, on all this. Right. You know, so in some ways that was good, in some ways that was bad because they, it was bad because they weren't really uh, taking each guy's physical ability and, and, and it was like everybody's doing the same thing. It's like cookie cutter, one right, size fits right. all when everyone has different styles and different ways of doing things. Yeah, because so when, you, when you're the first, that word academy to some people means something totally different. And so when we used to go out to the field, we used to have a guy that wanted us to march on the field every day. And March? So that didn't last very long. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> so, and so everybody had their different ways. You know, we, we brought in uh, Wes Santee, the great distance runner from KU, because uh, they, they brought him in to teach form running. Okay. And so that was okay for me, but uh, I, what I didn't like about it was we were on 260 acres outside of Sarasota, Florida, white sands, palmetto bushes, rattlesnakes. And he wanted to run like way out there. So, so, <laughs> no thanks. So, so I said, we don't have to run 90 feet. <laughs> right. So, so I didn't want to run that far. I, I, and then, you know, because a lot of days there, because uh, we were right across the street from the state park, Mayaka State Park, huh? and we had a big pond, and then wouldn't, you know, alligators show up? Or, oh, my gosh. In the heavy rains, we had rattlesnakes crawled up on the mounds. And, oh. and so it was, we, we, I've got stories. But, <laughs> I mean, we, we, they would stop games in the afternoon because the outfielders saw a big rattlesnake on the, <laughs> on, on, on the warning track. So in white sand, they're not that easy to see. Did so. you have a snake catcher in the dugout come out and grab the rattlesnake? You no, know, the ground crew guys did. The ground crew, oh, yeah. Right. Then my, my roommate, I uh, come in a room, and, and I'm saying, what is this smell? You know, we had these, these deals where we kept our, hung our jackets and stuff. Uh -huh. 
I said, what's the smell in this room? And, he, and, and I couldn't figure it out. So I finally opened the thing. I said, oh, my God. He had the snake skin hanging in the, and at least he says he wanted to make himself a belt. I said, you got to get this thing out of here. <laughs> so, so what he does, he doesn't just throw it away. He goes and put it in the boiler room, so, which is the warmest room in the, in the, in the uh, dormitory. And then everybody. Everyone's the smelling place, it. It was, like, it was like crazy. But. <laughs> Yeah, it was fun though. Well, it was interesting because before, so you, there's Municipal Stadium and there's Kauffman Stadium. And so we're getting into the 1973 season okay. or right before. So 72, you kind of, you were in, uh, were you in the minors by that point with uh, the Royals? I started in Double uh, A Jacksonville. So you're in Double A mm -hmm. Jacksonville. We go into the off season and you're like, I need a job. Mm -hmm. So you turn to Ewing Kaufman and he helped you kind of. Get a job. Well, I think sense, right? I think he turned to me. I think <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to help. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, really, you know, back in those days, uh, we had to work in the winter. I mean, they weren't really paying us that much money. So, so your season ended like August thirty first, and you're coming off a season where you're making five hundred a month. You know, you're not making a lot of money. Right. And so now you're trying to figure out how you're going to get from the end of August to April when you go to spring training, and you got a wife and baby, and uh, and so the first year, I couldn't find a job, so I drew unemployment. And so I don't think Miss Kate liked that too much. And so the next year, the, the chauffeur shows up at my house, and he says, well, i got to take you somewhere. So he takes me over on, on Armour Boulevard in, in, in Maine, where the, the labor union hall was. And he took me in, and they gave me a union card. And then I started working at the stadium. And so I worked at the stadium from September to April. And then I left the spring training, and I came back and played my first game in, in June, June. In the 12th. stadium you helped build. <laughs> Like just a few months later, you know, before you were there, you knew the, your way around the stadium, I suppose. I did know my way around, but I, you know, it, the word build is pretty big. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I spent most of my time carrying stuff to people that knew what they were doing. But <laughs> so, you, so you make your major league debut, and you were called up because of an injury to Freddie Podick yes. at uh, shortstop. Shortstop. So they, they, you started at shortstop. Yep, that was my position. I was a shortstop coming up, uh, and I, um, my first game was in Baltimore uh, when I came to the big leagues. Yeah, was I, was, I was reading that you had like an error and you were kind of like, like a ball kind of came and hit you in the chest. You're like, I'm glad that didn't happen in Kansas City, you know, making your debut. Well, that was, that was, yeah, that was, a, that was, a, mess, that was a messed up time when you, got, when you get to the big league, your first ground ball hits you in the chest. But, <laughs> but, but old Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, you know, the lights used to sit right on top of the stadium. And so we didn't have the high light poles like they do now. And so the, the, ball, the ball got in the sun, I didn't see it, and boom, there we go right there. They probably thought, Welcome to the majors. They're talking about, what the heck we doing with this guy up here? <laughs> you know, and being an academy guy made it worse because everybody thought they were giving you something all the time. Right. And so you had to show people that you could play, that you, that you know what you were doing, which really was hard to do at, at first because you had to get on the field, you had to do these things. But I had, fortunately, had a good spring training. Guys knew I could play. And so it was just a matter of just um, selling in. The next day, I started my first game. I went two for four, got my first hits, and, and then it was pretty much uh, on, on the move from there. When did you, did, so at first you were kind of playing second base, shortstop, and third base, kind of mm -hmm. utility guy in a sense. When did you eventually, or when did they decide to move you to second base permanently? I played a lot in 76. Whitey uh, Herzog was our manager, so we had just brought out AstroTurf. And so Cookie was a little slow on AstroTurf, so I played all the turf games, and he played most of the grass games on, on, on the road. And so I got a lot of playing in 76. And then in 77, at the end of 76, Cookie retired. And, and then I uh, played every day starting in 1977. What, what, what did you like about being a Major League Baseball player? Oh, uh, the excitement, uh, the fans, um, playing in front of big crowds, and being able to come through in key situations uh, when, when the game was on the line. I just I didn't mind the pressure. Um, I didn't. I didn't see myself being a 300 hitter, but I saw myself being a productive hitter. I was kind of. I was kind of mentally in that mode of the Orioles. You know, the Orioles were my. They had some of my favorite players. I loved them because they played good defense, mm -hmm. and uh, Frank Robinson was, was my favorite player. But you see a lot of guys hit 260, 270, but they're driving a lot of runs and they hit a lot of home runs. They, they're productive, and you, hit a lot, you see a lot of guys hit 300 but don't drive any runs. So that didn't appeal to me either. Uh, so I wanted to be a productive hitter. So I focused more on how to drive in runs rather than working on trying to hit for a high batting average. But I think it's interesting because at the time, I mean, you look at these contracts that these baseball players are making today in the tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And back then, like you said, it was like 
You were getting paid five hundred dollars a month to play professional baseball uh, in the minor leagues. Uh, my so what was the, what was in, the raise in, when you got in, to in the major leagues? Major, <laughs> major leagues, my first year in '73, uh, the minimum salary was fourteen thousand a year. Okay, that's better. Yeah. That's better, but so, that's still and, and I guess it's the '70s, so fourteen thousand probably went a lot further. But uh, I think the minimum salary, the average salary was maybe sixty-five hundred uh, wow. for the worker. Uh, that wasn't an, wasn't a baseball player, but okay. uh, but you know it was a non free agency, and and we basically were two percent increases, three percent increases until we got to free agency, and that's when the open market just sort of blew things open at that right. point. I want to go through some of your teammates and talk about them. Um, first of all, your Gold Gloves. I mean, th that's got to be something you took pride in was was your defense because that's what you're known for, right? I mean, eight Gold Gloves. Uh, has anyone ever surpassed that in the American League? Oh yeah, yeah, you got At second base. Yeah, you have uh, Alomar. Oh, uh, Roberto Alomar. Uh, he might be. I think he might be the highest. Uh, and but then, still, I mean, that's. But you took pride in your defense. Well, I mean, defense was what I really enjoyed playing. Uh, when I came up, like I say, Baltimore, I really admired those guys. And and one year they had a Gold Glove infield and Gold Glove pitcher, Gold Gloves and center fielder. I said, man, that's pretty cool. Right. But you know, before free agency, guys would kind of stop in one spot. They were going to be there. And Bobby Gritch was the second baseman that I uh, was watching when I first came up. And free, when free agency started in 77, then Bobby went to California as a shortstop in free agency. And I said, OK, this is my chance. And, and then I said, if you're ever going to do it, you got to do it now. And that's when I, uh, my first year, 77, uh, made seven errors, and then I won six six straight gold gloves after that. So it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Do you still have those at home? I have some of them at home. I gave one to each of my kids because no one comes to my house and look 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 at what I have. But but, <laughs> but you have. You, I figure if I give it to one of my kids, they'll put it on their mantle, and people will talk about it. Oh and yeah, all that kind of stuff. That's so, really cool. Yeah. So you talk about you all Washington. He just passed away recently. Yeah, Wash Wash was a he's an academy guy and. Um, you know, I was. Did you know him at the academy? Did you meet him and play with him in the no, academy? No, uh, I was in the first class. He was in the fourth class, so I didn't know him until he actually came up, came to. Um, I think it was '77 when he came up with Willie Wilson from the minor leagues. I knew of him, but didn't really know him that well. Uh, but it was, it was sad he passed away a few few weeks ago and went to his service. And but the thing about you all and I, uh, we we're both good athletes. We we're both shortstops by trade, and when we played on the field, we covered a lot of ground and we made a lot of plays. and And we played together in the '80 World Series, and we became the first uh, all African American shortstop second base combo wow. to uh, play in a World Series in American League history. So that that's was, great. And being two academy guys, I thought that was pretty special. That is, that's really special. What was up with the toothpick? Well, he said he's always done it. I mean, he, he said two picks help me, chewing on two picks help me relax. Well, some guys chew bubble gum, some guys chew uh -huh. tobacco. He said, this is how I relax. So. Did you make fun of him for it? No, I, no, I figured he, he knew what he was doing. But, <laughs> but he said it's, it's one of those things where you, you hit 273 with it and 220 without it. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so, so you go back to what works. Good so pick in like, the mouth, yeah. <laughs> what, what combo, I mean, you think about that, that combo, the shortstop second base combo, and how important it is for turning double plays. Uh, what shortstop was your favorite to work with in the field? You know, I think all of them were uh, were favorites when they were there because it was just a matter of just knowing what he, what each guy likes to do, and, and they know what you like to do. They know when you like to gamble, not gamble, those type things. You have to spend a lot of time uh, getting to know each other that way. Uh, from a physical standpoint, UL was the most physical that I played with. Like the most athletic as far as covering ground? Athletic. Physical, his temperament, uh, very aggressive. You know, because back then, you didn't have any protection for people sliding into second base to break up double plays. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't have a, a tough shortstop, they were willing to. Uh, we call them low bridge guys, meaning you have to throw down here to make them slide. If they don't slide, they get hit. That kind of thing. So if they knew that you would be that aggressive then they wouldn't be as aggressive coming in to second base. Anyway, uh, so just having guys like that was, uh, so between Ewell and Freddie, I think those two guys were probably the, the most um, competitive uh, in terms of trying to get guys down and throw the ball through guys and not try to throw around guys. So those those were your cool. first two shortstops, right? Uh, Freddie uh, was my first. And then when he left, then Ewell came out after Freddie. <laughs> after that, I had a host of them. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, a lot, it's kind of a revolving door for a while there. Right. Let's talk about George Brett. You guys kind of started together uh, with the Royals. You guys stay close? You still good friends? You know, I don't see much of George. I assume we're friends, but I, I, mean, <laughs> but, but I never, I never, I, I don't see him very often unless I go out to the stadium or run into him or something like that. Uh, George, George was a year behind me. Uh, we played together in A-ball and uh, we played together in AAA. And then I, I came up about two weeks ahead of George, and then I was playing third when he came up. And then we flip-flopped for a little bit, and then he finally became the regular third baseman, and I was a utility guy for a couple of years and, until I started to play every day. What was it like playing with George? Uh, he had this fiery temper, this desire to win that really was unmatched at the time. Yeah, he was, uh, he was, he was what they call a gamer, you know. He, was, he, got, he came to play every day. He hustled, and uh, no matter what kind of night he had the night before, he, he had 100% on the field. He required everybody else to play at 100%. And our whole team was like that. I mean, we just, we just had a team where everybody held each other accountable. Uh, for what we had to do, and uh, the big guys uh, would hold you accountable for not getting guys over, and and that was they. they I, I don't get I don't bun a guy over. They'll come look at you and say no, <laughs> you know they they'll let you know about it. That's good. You know, they don't come pat you on the back and say get them tomorrow. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back then we had we didn't have free agency. Everybody made their money at the end of the year. You know, by stacking up numbers. So if you don't get guys in position for your big guys to drive them in, they get upset. Mm. And so if you don't do your job as a, as a setup guy, then the manager gets upset. So everybody had a role to play. And, and, and I think with George, uh, you know, when George first came up, you know, he struggled uh, his first year. Uh, and uh, he was more of a pull hitter. And uh, the thing that he did, along with uh, Hal McRae, the guy with Charlie Lau, our, our batting coach, and so they went out every single day, every day. And so Charlie changed George's swing. He changed uh, Mac's swing, where George was hitting more balls to left field and left center field. Mac was the other way. And and earlier, George had a hard time doing it because it, it would just be like little flares going out like this. And then as he got stronger and, and figured out how to do it, then uh, this was like 74 and then 76. You know, he and Hal went down to the last day for the batting title. So that was yeah. Uh, that was pretty fun to watch. That was exciting. That batting title, um, it was fascinating just really digging into that. Uh, they were based, I mean, Hal McRae had it, right? All he had to do was outperform uh, George on the last day, and they were mm -hmm. playing the Twins. Well, actually, there was three guys involved. There. Rock Carew. Rock Carew, right. Carew right. All involved. three of them were right next to each other. He was in the last day. I mean, pretty exciting stuff to watch. Yeah, and then... Uh, George hits a fly ball to left field, but the left fielder misplays it. And that's why, well, that's what they said. That's, well, you, I don't know. You, I think you said it right. <laughs> is, that, is that about right? He misplayed it, so George had an inside the park home run. Right. And then Hal gets up, and he grounded out to short. And so George basically beat him by one hit yeah, for the batting was, title. And then it, Hal accused the manager of the Twins of racism. Uh, and it, it, was it, it wasn't pretty. But contentious. <laughs> it wow. was it was very contentious. What are you doing this whole time? Are you just kind of sitting there as, a, as an observer watching all this? I mean... I was upset because the way the guy played the ball. I mean, yeah. it just wasn't. And, and, and Hal hit a, a one hopper to the shortstop, and they made the play, and he, and he was upset. It was like, it was like, uh, if you look at it from a competitive standpoint, it was a great race. Uh, but if you try to get inside the, the the weeds of it, then it's not it's not so much fun. Right, right. Uh, but uh, but I, I mean, but just to see these two guys turn their careers around the way they did, because uh, Hal we traded for him from Cincinnati, yep. and he struggled his first year. And so both of those guys came, and they started working together. And before you know it, they were both just outstanding players for a long time. Did you work with Charlie Lau on your uh, batting at all? Did that help at all? I think Charlie probably honed in on those two guys, and um, that's where he, he put his, his attention. Uh, but, you know, he would, he would give you good tips, and, and, but he didn't really invest the time in, in us like he did in those two guys. Uh, it, was, um, it was amazing how... They didn't. He didn't. He, they, they didn't just become good hitters. They became just good players. I mean, they they would stretch singles into doubles and take guys out of double play. And so everybody else just sort of uh, just fell in line with that. I mean, Whitey made a statement one day that says, "What I like about our team is I got seven guys that can go into second base as hard as anybody in baseball." Uh -huh. And so, and it really helped me because it helped me having those two guys because. They know how devastating these two guys were, and so they would they would be a lot easier on me. So it was, <laughs> so it was, it was a lot more fun, right? Yeah, so that's fun. interesting. No one probably liked playing the Royals at that time. No, no, not at all. And and going to AstroTurf, they really hated us because we had a lot of speed. And, oh yeah, and we knew how to play it. A lot of teams didn't know how to play it, and we were actually ninety feet better than anybody that came in there. 
And the turf itself, what teams didn't really realize is that when it's cold, it plays like this floor. But the hotter it gets, the more it expands and the more spongy it gets. And, oh. and so if you hit a, like a short ball out in the outfield, where normally a guy would just sit back and take it in, in, uh, in, in, in hot days, if you get too close to the ball, it's going to hit, it's going to go up. And you're going to, and you're going to have to leave your feet to try to keep it from doing it. And then guys would read that, and you go from first to second, take extra bases, things like that. Interesting. So you would kind of play when you're running the bases. You would see how they're fielding the ball, and you would know yeah. right away he's not going to do. He's not going to get it smoothly. I'm off. Right, because normally if a guy comes in, <laughs> if he's not going to catch it, it's going to be a problem. Right. And, and so Did you like playing on AstroTurf? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with your speed, I guess, going back and forth. Yeah, I loved it because it showed every aspect of your abilities. Uh -huh. And when you go <laughs> when you go to like Detroit, where they got high grass and. And uh, balls. they wet the baselines down, and, and so you, you you go from turf to there, and all of a sudden you're running by balls. You know? Right, right. So, so I always tell Lou Whitaker and Trammell, I said, you guys, we come in, we got we got to go by ball, stop, come back, and then <laughs> you, but when they come to our place, you can tell the big difference. I mean, it it, it was a big big difference. Home field advantage right there. Home field advantage. Uh, all the dirt fields and grass fields were cut different. Uh, huh. I think the speediest one was uh, Arlington, the, the Rangers. They had the one that was the fastest, but everybody else was high grass and uh, it was okay. stuff like that. So I love the story of the pine tar incident. Um, after George hit that home run, he comes in and he was sitting next to you, <laughs> and the the umps are talking, and the, you know Billy Martin's out, and they're taking the bat and they're talking and. And George turns to you and says, what, what, what's going on there? What did you say? Well, it, it actually, by the blue, was next to him. I was, I was the next guy over. So, okay. so if you ever watch that video and you see a guy sitting up on the bench, like, like that's me. So, <laughs> so, it's, 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 so it's like uh, he comes in, and so I'm looking around. Uh, Billy Martin's got all the umpires in, in, the, in the middle of the field. Dick Hauser, he's still on the bench. And the Yankees don't like us, no way. Right. And so, and Billy, you know, he intimidated, he, he was really intimidating umpires. So I said, George, I said, they're going to call you out. And he says, they're not going to do that. I said, yes, they are. <laughs> he, said, he said, why would they do that? I said, well, Billy's got these guys out here. We're in New York. They don't like us. Our manager's on the bench. I said, you out. <laughs> and he looks at me. He says, I can't tell you what he said anywhere. <laughs> but, but, but in the, the end. The quote's in the book, by the way. In, 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 in the end, he says, uh, if they call me out, I'm gonna lose my mind. And I, then as soon as they called him out, he was like, <laughs> "Out!" He was he, he was out the dugout. No, nobody's gonna catch him. I, I don't. I mean, I don't even know how these guys even. Cause I think Joe. Bro Joe well, you weren't gonna catch him when you were sitting back like this. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't have tried. No, no, I wouldn't have tried. Nope, just let him. Hey, he's on his, on his own at that point. So, but, he, but when he got out there, I think Joe Brinkman's the one that's got him by the neck. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the guy, the tall umpire on the other side, uh, he's like 6'7". Right. And, and George, afterwards, he says, well, I'm glad somebody finally stopped me because the closer I got, the bigger he looked. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, was a, it was a very hectic day. Um, I know Gaylord Perry, um, uh, some kind of way the bat got over to the dugout. And, yep. And somebody flipped the bat over the dugout. The kid took the bat out, started running up the runway to the clubhouse, and got up these umpires chasing and cops. These cops chasing the guys up the, up the runway. They finally it's like the Keystone Cops. It, it, was, it, was, it was crazy. It was, it, was, it was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. But it, it was fun for me because I just I just sit there and just laugh. Just it was, watched it. Was it. Great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know the, uh, Joe Posnanski uh, wrote the 50 greatest moments in baseball history, and he had a survey for every team for their top moment. Mm -hmm. And Royals fans say the top moment is this: the Pine Tar incident. Yeah, he probably couldn't get away with that today. No, <laughs> yeah, he'd be kicked out. <laughs> but back then, he, he was. Uh, it was pretty. Uh, we had to go back and play that half inning, and yeah, uh, that was crazy too. Yeah, you had you had pictures in the outfield. Yeah, you had people all over the place. So we got He the, was mad. Yeah, we got Again, he didn't like each other. Right. And on the way back to the airport, some guy threw a brick off a bridge and broke our bus window. What? It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty intense. Yeah. Yeah. We, we got that half inning. Like we got that half inning and we was out of there. New Yorkers are yeah. jerks. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking a little bit about Hal and his intensity on the base pads, and they had the Hal McRae rule, right? Because he kept sliding into guys and hurting them. Well, he wasn't sliding into them. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he was tackling them. I mean, they had no rules. I mean, you could cross body block guys. You could you could do you could run over guys. You just they just had no rules. And uh, Hal had this way. I, I mean, Hal wasn't like really fast, but he was but he was quick. You know, he, you know, like some fast guys. 
can run 90 feet and get there in a hurry. Some guys can't. Mm -hmm. And some guys not fast and get there. So he always seemed to be there. And, uh, but he was the kind of guy that uh, if he's running to take out a double play, he wouldn't even want to slide. I mean, he just he just put his head down and let the ball hit him in the helmet, uh -huh. and 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 that's that's the kind of guy he was. Uh, I mean, uh, he would uh, uh, have a let's say you had a run on second base, and and he's on first base, then he'll tell the guy on second base on a ground ball just keep going because <laughs> I'm right behind you. I'm stop it. No, because he's gonna he's gonna do something at second base, and the guy won't be able to throw the ball, and, he, and, oh, and the guy it. scores. Okay. So okay. in '77. Uh, he did that to Willie Randolph. So he went down. He, Freddie was on second base, and he told Freddie, you know, if you're on the ground, you just, you just keep going. And the ground ball came, the, the throw came to Willie Randolph from the shortstop, and, and, and Hal did a cross body block, but he, he, but he did it in a way that he could roll him up. And then if you watch the video, you could just see him take his hand and just tell, tell, tell Freddie to keep going. <laughs> and, and that's when they changed the whole rules about sliding into second base. Did you, did you guys hang out outside of the games? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, all the time. To go out to dinner and drinks and go to each other's houses. Not at home. <laughs> when we got home, we just we got tired of being on the road. We, oh, <laughs> we, that, yeah. we didn't do much at home unless it's a long home stand. But on the road, you guys were really yeah. hang out. Uh -huh. on. You had your favorite guys you hung out with. But what we, didn't, we, didn't hang, we didn't hang out as a team. You know, so. Oh, just kind of individuals. Mm -hmm. who, were, who were your favorite guys? You know, Hal was a good guy to have lunch with, but you didn't want to go out to dinner. You didn't want to go out after <laughs> after hours with him because Hal was one of those guys that. You know, he'll have a few drinks, and, and when he figures he's had enough, he'll just leave. He won't even tell you he's gone. He's just gone. I'm oh, out of here. So, so he's not a good guy to go out with. Right, after, right, after right, hours. right. But yeah. it, most, most times, guys will just sit around the hotel bar. Okay. And we'll just talk about the game. Yeah. yeah it was a lot of fun, though. We talk about, oh, there, we talk about Cookie Rojas. Um, did you guys get along? Because you eventually took his position, and I know there was some internal competition there, and I'm sure yeah, he really. saw the writing on the wall a little bit, right? I mean, because he wasn't well, playing home games on I, the turf. I, didn't, I don't think he saw it as competition. I mean, Cookie was, uh, when, I, when, when I came up, Cookie, and he's from the era where they didn't even talk to rookies. And so when I came up, it was about just watching. And it's, I mean, he didn't teach me how to feel, but what he was good at is teaching you the shortcuts, how to get a job done. And so he made a play one day, and... And usually, if, if a veteran guy didn't talk to you, you just didn't say nothing. Uh -huh. you know, so you didn't really initiate the conversation. So, and so he made a play that I was really curious about. And I said, dang, I wonder why he made that play that way. Right. And I sit there for a minute, and I said, well, are you going to cool. take that shot, to take the chance to do that? So, so I, I said, Cookie, I said, uh, you know Cookie. Cookie was no-nonsense, real serious guy. <laughs> you know, and I said, you know, why did you make that play like that? Never answered. And I said, mm, okay. <laughs> so, so I said, I'm going to ask him this question every day until he says something. Right? Nice. So, and so finally after about the third day, he looked at me and says, listen, I'm going to be playing. I'm going to be managing. And back in those days, older players kind of managed in winter ball. And so he said, I'm going to be managing in Venezuela this winter. If you come play for me, then I'll tell you what you need to know. And so that was the challenge. So I said, okay, I'll take the challenge. You did. So, so I went played for him. It was in Maracaibo, Venezuela. And I uh, went out with him every day and, wow. and just learned these shortcuts to how, how you do things at second base. And so I was still pretty new at learning how to play second base. So, huh. But, uh, but uh, I was athletic, so they helped a lot in turn, turning double plays and things like that. But, but that's, how you, uh, that's how you got things out of guys like that. You, right. just, you just have to be a little persistent, but not too persistent. So. I, love, I love Cookie got his name because his mom would call him Cookie in Spanish, which means charming. Um, but the American journalists didn't know what he was saying, so they just wrote it cookie, and then he just, <laughs> he just took it, took that moniker. Uh, Willie Nelson, oh, sorry, this, this thing acted up. Willie Wilson. Um, Man, I'm telling you. He was a great center fielder, so much speed out there. You know, to me, the only thing that separated him and Bo Jackson was strength. Oh, yeah. I mean, Willie was as fast, as athletic, uh, didn't have the, but he didn't have the arm strength. But uh, in terms of, he made himself a switch hitter, Yep. And won the batting title in 82. But this guy, uh, if you want to watch uh, poetry in motion running a triple, uh, this guy is he's 6'2", and you can just watch him. And when you get about halfway between first and second, uh, just another jet kicked in. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy that had 13 inside the park home runs. Wow, and, and and never struggled at at home plate. He just wasn't breathing hard. He, he just wasn't breathing right hard. Through. Yeah, he was he was a great center fielder. He won his only Gold Glove in left field. 
So because oh. he was so fast, because they get a base hit through the infield, he's so fast, he's right there. Yeah. You know where, but that's the only Gold Glove he won was in left field because back in those days, uh, only center fielders won Gold Gloves, and so now they have it specialized by position. Yeah. And so, but that that's how. But this guy, uh, it wasn't nothing. This guy. Uh, he was exciting. He was very exciting. It was interesting that he played catcher in high school, mm -hmm. and then they tr they moved him obviously. Yeah, the the, I mean they was speed. routinely still at sixty bases a year. I mean, yeah, yeah. he yeah. was he was amazing. He was fun to watch for sure. Um, let's talk about the World Series. I mean, oh, how much fun was that for you guys to finally break through? Because you were there mm -hmm. for the three American League championships against the Yankees that you lost in the '70s, and then the '80 World Series against the Phillies. You made the playoffs a couple more times, didn't really get past the first round. Now, boom, 85 happens. Wow. <laughs> it's exciting. Wow, well, I mean, that was, uh, it's, it's an unexplainable experience uh, because you, you don't know how it's going to end. Uh, I, think, I think when you get in the World Series, it's like uh, you go through the playoffs, right? And you get through the playoffs, you get to the World Series, you're playing against the Cardinals, which is exciting anyway. And, and you just wanted to uh, get off to a good start. I mean, that year in the playoffs, it was the first year we went from a five-game playoffs in the, in the playoffs to a seven-game uh, series in the playoffs. So we were able to, so we were three down to Toronto in the playoffs, and we said, Jesus. So you get that, so, so it's amazing when you don't have anything to play with, you just, every day, you're just throwing it all out there every day. And so we finally got it back to even, and then we won the seventh game and, and, and advanced to the series. We played the Cardinals. Uh, very good games the first couple games, and, and we lost our first two games, one game three. That's the one I hit a home run in game three. And then we came back to Kansas City with, for game six and seven. And game six was probably the most exciting game I think I've ever played in. Mm -hmm. uh, it was tense. Yeah, because it went down to the bottom of the ninth, and uh, we got a break. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was safe. It looked safe to me. It's a well, good call. But today's standard, it wouldn't have happened. But, All right. but I think baseball is one of the games where you don't want to, I don't think you should ever want to get everything right. I think because people don't have nothing to talk about. You know, <laughs> okay. You, know, okay. you can't build rivalries getting everything right, you know? Right. I mean, do the home runs if you want, and that's fine, but. All the little intricate things. I mean, I was safe at second base too, but they didn't. They, right. They didn't replay that one on the steel. No. So it's no. it's like that's that's what this game's all about, you know. I mean, managers used to just go sprinting out and yelling at umpires and get your little thing going and get the players excited. Now, oh. now, but now they now they take one step and say, "Oh, let's wait a minute. What, right. What's this? <laughs> right. Now you lost all your momentum." Yeah. Uh, but 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 I think that. Uh, uh, that, that, to me, that was uh, the most exciting game. That the bottom of the sixth, I mean, the bottom of the ninth and the sixth in, in game Like six. the most exciting game you've ever played in in your career? That's the most intense half inning of baseball I think I've ever been in because it was like, uh, you know, you're in your mind you're saying, oh, God, here we go again, you know. You can't get over this hump. You can't win this thing. Yep. And as things start unfolding, then you said, okay, let me, because um, I had went up to the clubhouse. And so I was frustrated because, you know, we were in this position again. And Reggie Jackson was doing, uh, he, was, he was still a player, but he was doing, was it ABC? He was doing ABC at that time. And so I was talking to him, and because we only, you know, not only got big monitors in the clubhouse, but back in those days, you only had one TV in the clubhouse other than the manager's office and a little, little black and white box. <laughs> anyway, so we were just sitting there watching the TV in there, and, and then George get the break at first base. Yeah. And then... Uh, Jack uh, Clark misses a pop-up, then Balboni gets a base hit. And I said, I got to get down here. Reggie said, no, you're going to break it. You, you can't go yet. You can't go yet. So, <laughs> so, I, so I'm just sitting there just, 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 just you know, I just got to, I got to So you go. weren't coming up to bat or anything? No, I wasn't coming up to bat. Okay, no, I was going to no. say. Was, there, like, there, there was a ways for me. But <laughs> I was like, get back in the yeah. dugout. So uh, then we tried to bump the runners over, and, uh, and so they forced the run at third. And then it was a wild pitch, and so now I, I said, Reg, I got to go. He said, yeah. no, no, just wait, just wait. And then uh, that's when we brought in order to pitch it, and then order gets the base. Soon as he hit the ball, it's gone. You're right. Yeah, I, 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 I got to go celebrate with my team. But it, it was great, though. I mean, it was, uh, it was very intense. Uh, there was a lot of emotion. Uh, I think in our minds, we could have easily said the series is, this is it, you know, because uh -huh. this is the first time that people rushed into the clubhouse. Everybody's all going nuts, and, and so we said, oh, man, this is great. And so game seven was probably the easiest game I ever played in my life. Because everyone uh, was relaxed. You knew because, you were going to win. Yeah, once Daryl once hit the two-run homer, and 
it just the floodgates just opened up. Yeah. And I drove in a run somewhere around the fifth inning. It was the tenth run of the game, and and then it was like, okay, let's just get this thing over with, you know. So we can celebrate. I mean, it was funny because game. you know, in Game Six, what was funny about Game Six is that you know. We had to buy champagne, right? Yeah. And they have champagne in these in these baskets that you, with wheels on it. So you're rolling it from one side, one end, and to the other side. <laughs> and so the clubhouse kids are wearing themselves out, just rolling the thing which, back Which and guys are getting the champagne? And, so in the, in the bottom of the night, they had no they had they had no clue what to do. And so, <laughs> and so, but game seven was so easy. It was just easy, man. Once we got fifth in, the champagne seven. was already there. Just waiting yeah, for we it. just said, let's those strikes. Let's get it over with. Yeah. And and we watched them go through some of their antics and things like that, but. But you know the one thing that we, about that I found out about it's about the seven game series is that you know like if people would watch that series, you think game six was the end of the series, right? And just like the '86 uh, World Series with the, with the Red Sox when the ball goes through Buckner's leg, you think you think that as that is that is the series, but that's only game, it was only game six, right? So had a what's, so what's hard to do for these teams is to forget about game six and focus on game seven. And that's what I think the Cardinals hurt themselves with because they were still complaining about game six rather than being ready to play game seven. And you were ready to play game seven. Oh, we were excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we only have a couple more. Bo Jackson. Oh, boy. I mean, my favorite player growing up just because anytime he came up, you never knew what he was going to do. What was it like for you being able to watch, like, basically, mm -hmm. inarguably, the greatest athlete to ever play Major League Baseball? Yeah, I wouldn't doubt that at all. I mean, Bo could do things. Um, that I don't think the normal person even thought about knowing how to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see guys dive for a ball in the outfield and go sliding 20, 30 feet. Bo would dive for a ball, tuck his shoulder, be on his feet. You know, and, yeah. and that probably comes from football, you know, getting knocked down and getting up. But, uh, but his, his arm was unbelievably strong when he made the throw in Seattle uh, on a 3-2 uh, base hit to get Harold Reynolds. Yep. Uh, running up the wall in Baltimore. Um, and you were there for all that. Uh -huh. I saw it all. Yeah, saw it, it all. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Bo was one of those guys that was, he was very mentally tough. Mm -hmm. He was one of those guys, if you told him he couldn't do something, he figured out a way to do it. And, I mean, the one year he hit 32 home runs and drove in 105 runs for a guy that's not so good a good player. I mean, that, that, was, that was pretty that was pretty impressive. About time he gets inducted into the Royals Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. I mean, he had, he had just world-class speed. And... I mean, I remember one time we were playing Baltimore and, and Rick Dempsey was catching. And Rick Dempsey about 195. But, but he was tough. And Bo was on third base. And there was a ground ball. He threw the ball to Dempsey and, and Bo. I mean, Bo had the ability in, in three steps he could be in full speed. Uh -huh. And I mean, that, that was a collision. That was unbelievable. Wow. Glove goes one way, mask goes the other way. <laughs> And he ends up in the Royals on deck circle, flipping over us. Oh, my gosh. And both still just standing there watching. It was, it was crazy. He, just, he was some kind of strong. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and finally, life after baseball. So you retire. You've written a book. Mm -hmm. uh, you managed for a while. Now you're the county executive. What's life been like, you've, like for you after baseball? You know, man, I think I'm probably the luckiest guy in Kansas City. I really do. I mean, I came from picking cotton in Mississippi to being a busboy, a fry cook, uh, a waiter. I mean, I've done a lot of crazy jobs, but, but I think uh, just being able to be always be in a place where uh, it, was, uh, it was up to me what, what happens to me, it was up to me whether or not I was going to be successful or not, just being able to meet that challenge uh, and, and being able to be successfully meeting those challenges, I mean, I think that uh, just being able to be in those positions to do that. I mean. I didn't uh, think that I'd ever write a book. I never thought I'd even be in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when I got into it, I got in it because I was curious. And now I'm almost, what, 11, 10 years into it, and yeah. I'm just saying to myself, have, help, well, I love the job. I do. I love helping people. I love, I mean, the criticism sometimes is warranted, sometimes not, but, but that comes with being an elected official. But, but I think that uh, the heart is always right. I think the integrity is always right. And I think the caring is always right because I think that my parents instilled in me uh, being humble. Uh, take me, take care of my neighbors. You know, I was that guy that uh, I had a shovel in the winter and a, a lot more in the summer and a rake in the, in the fall. And I go to my neighbors and help them out. Uh, I would the elderly folks in our neighborhood. You knock on their door, see if they need anything from the store. If they're at the store, you help them home with it. So we took care of our neighbors back in those days, 
And so I just still have that spirit of, uh, of, of making someone's life better. And I think that's, this just gives me a higher platform to do it. And uh, is everything always going to be perfect? No. But the effort is always perfect. I love it. Well, I want to leave it at that because that was, that was a great final answer. And I know that some people have some questions. I want to give you guys time to a ask any questions if you have any. So obviously we have the two mics. Uh, if you guys want to step on up and ask a question, please feel free. Good evening. Um, my question is for or about the Royals Academy. Mm -hmm. So I knew about the Academy, know that three came out that played Major League Baseball, right? Yourself, UL, Washington, and Ron. Fourteen total. Four? Fourteen. Fourteen. Mm -hmm. oh, then I stand mm -hmm. correct. That's mm -hmm. better than I thought. The, probably the most famous ones, those three you named. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned that y'all went to class in yes. the mornings, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, until you expanded on that a little bit more, I was like, okay, well, that's instruction for baseball, right? Because they're taking these athletes in that. Was that something that you and Kaufman mm -hmm. did, and and why did he do that? Just well, curious. well, we went to uh, junior college because he thought that we had to put an education piece to it. Uh, he was thinking about after you got through playing. Uh, uh, he only had one mandatory class that he wanted us to take, and that was public speaking, because he figured once you got into the game, you'd be doing interviews and things like that. He wanted guys to be able to talk and, and understand what they were saying, things like that. And, but other than that, uh, it was uh, just normal, normal classes. But, yeah. but, they, but everyone had to take that, that one right. class for sure. Not surprised to hear that, that he was thinking of others mm -hmm. about that, if you know, I mean, a little bit. So, right. but yeah, that's pretty impressive. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Come on up. We're all friends here. Um, it's, I'm so glad I made it. I, I'm so glad to, uh, to hear um, everything you had to share. Right Thank now. you. you step closer to the mic? Thank you. OK. <laughs> but really, I just wanted to hear, could you repeat what you said at the end there? You said the heart is always right. And then you said two things after that. Oh, well, the, heart, the heart's always there. The effort's already there. It's always there. Uh, I think those are the two things that I, I just really wanted to, uh, and the, you know, the caring, the heart, and, and, the, uh, and the effort. Uh, I think, well, thank uh, you for your service. I also uh, was a, have been a server in the community, and I've waited on you, and you're, a, you're just a fantastic human. Um, thank you. My daughter is Lincoln Academy alumni as well, so yeah, there nice. we go. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the blisters on your feet from the Astro Turf. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, the hardest thing about the turf map was that uh, the first turf was like plant on this floor. I yeah, mean, yeah, it, it was it was uh, it was asphalt padding and and turf and. It didn't, but it didn't have it didn't have any type of draining system to go with it, and so when it rained, uh, the water would pool, and so oh, wow. when guys hit balls through the infield, you had to chase the ball because it would get waterlogged, yeah. and or else you uh, at the end of the game they bring out this zamboni machine, but that would suck the water out of the carpet, but at the same time it was compressing everything, oh, and gosh. and by the end of the uh, first couple of months the ground was so dang on hard, and we didn't have. Uh, what they call astroturf shoes, as they do now. We just had spikes. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to do was take my spikes up to the grinder and get them grinded down oh, to wow. where they was almost like slippers because if you go at the normal height, your ankles roll over a lot and then you get the ankles taped every night and things like that. But, but on hot days, uh, most of the shoes were plastic coated you know, plastic bottom. Yeah. And so on those 90 degree days when the turf's 130 degrees. They melt. Then it, it, it gets hot, believe yeah. me. It, your feet are smoking. And, and so you have to go in. I used to keep a pair of shoes right inside the clubhouse door, but which was air conditioned. And then I changed shoes every, it, when I could. Yeah. And, or else you would take water, and you, or you wore your oldest pair of shoes. Oh, my gosh. And then you just pour water down your, <laughs> down your feet. And somebody came up with a great idea. They, they came up with these, uh, uh, Inner soles that were liquid, and you freeze them, right? Oh, and then but you put them in to keep it. Then cool. you put them in your shoe, but it, but then when it when it, when it heats it. up and it gets hot, they burst. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so so it was always some way to. And then we had ice trays, and guys would come in between games. They would 
uh, like been in a sand trap, you know, you, get, you, right. you try to get your uh, feet down in, uh, in these ice Did trays. you get a lot of rug burns? God, man. Because when I, I played football at Northwestern, oh. and when, we, when I got there, the turf was just like Hoffman Stadium. It was hard as concrete, and after every game, I mean, your forearms, your elbows, oh like the you know, pads. I got most of mine in here because when I die for a ball, I was like, what the heck are you doing? And so I would always try to catch myself. Oh, <laughs> and so I yeah. always end up burning here because I knew my elbows would just get cooked on those days. I mean, so yeah. it... Yeah, that, that, was, it was, that was bad. That was bad, those days. Those days were hard, but, you know, we got through it. Uh, I love that insight, though. That's a good question, yeah. the rug burns. Mm -hmm. We have or time for one more. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much, Frank. Yeah, thank uh, you, sir. Love the stories. Thank I mean, you. Not, thank you. I mean, I remember Cookie Rojas, seven, what, seven years in the National League before he came to us, and then uh, I was at the game, his last game that he ever played. Mm -hmm. What did he do? We, we switch caps. He, uh, mm -hmm. well, he jumping That's in the fountain. Oh, you mean the fountain? Oh, you know, you know, the story about that fountain thing is that uh, he and Freddie had pre-planned that if we won, they were going to run out and, mm -hmm. and jump in the fountain. Okay, right, but they didn't tell anybody else. Right, oh, right. right. And so once they started running out toward the fountain, you had, you had people behind the scenes running like mad to get down there and turn the thing up because they got electrocuted. It, uh, it, so it, so they, it, it caused a lot of chaos by doing it, but right. but this but this because the guys down there running that fountain were just terrified. I mean they were, <laughs> but, but they, yeah. that was that was good. That was good when they did that. Oh yes. yeah, but anyhow, that's great memory I have. And uh, the other things you talked about, uh, speed, speed kills. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean Vince Coleman <laughs> was with us, and when he got on first base. Mm -hmm. The whole complexion of the game changed. Yeah. Baseball and speed is, oh. is dangerous together. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's crazy. And, uh, and you played with and against some of the fastest guys, Willie Wilson, you mentioned, Al McCray. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, Fred, was he the first designated hitter in the American League? No, because 73, 73 uh, everybody had a DH in 73. I don't think that was the first year of the DH, I think. Uh, but but we, had, we, had, we had a lot of guys. I mean, uh, I was still in 20 bases. Otis was still in 60 bases. Freddie was still in 60 bases. Uh, Willie, UL. I mean, every team had speed, and especially at the top. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the game has changed so much. We, well, our team on turf, you, you couldn't have the big, lumbering guy. You had to have athletic guys. And so our shortstops and middle infields looked like our outfielders. But you just had but they had different strength levels. And so we had a lot of guys that could hit 20, 25 home runs, but they played and what I really man, we played great defense. Oh, and uh, and Amos Otis was the best Yeah, who's better, he or Willie Wilson? Uh, Willie was a lot faster. Okay. Amos, Amos was a was a was a game manager. I mean, a Amos managed a game better than anybody I ever played with in the outfield. Mm -hmm. He would always keep the double play in order. He wouldn't throw out anybody unless he knew he could throw them out. Yeah. He was accurate. Mm -hmm. He was fundamentally really good. He was so smooth in center field. Everybody thought he was loafing all the time. Yeah. You know, but but this guy was a hell of an athlete. Yes. Yeah. And also, did you ever play against Ricky Henderson? Yes. Really? <laughs> I enjoy oh, playing. Yeah. I enjoy playing against Ricky Anderson. Okay. Uh, Ricky was so dang on fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was built low to the ground, and he was in full speed and two or three steps, and and he could. But you know, back in the, we didn't have slide step back in those days, so more pitches were more geared toward we just aren't going to walk people. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have the, the 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 crazy moves they have the first base. They just their focus was those strikes, put the ball in play. But Ricky. I used to frustrate Ricky because he had always like once he once he stole second base, his legs were warm and he wanted to just go right to the next base, but always put two pickoff plays on, yeah, by, right behind him, stealing bases. So that <laughs> that just drive him nuts. Yeah. Uh, but he was, uh, I mean, and 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 Ricky was really about as about as strong as as uh, oh he was as huge. Both. His legs yeah. were just, just uh, so tremendously strong. strong. And Willie, I think he played, shoot, till, till he was, what, 20, he played 20 some odd, 24 played years. Played a long time. Played yeah. a long time, yeah. yeah. Great athlete. Really Thanks helped. for those great questions, sir. I just want to wrap this up. Mm -hmm. Me too. <laughs> wrap it up. Okay. But anyhow, it comes down to Bobby Witt Jr. Yes, sir. My God. And I'll... You want to leave it like, you want to leave it like that, right? <laughs> I will. Yeah, he's going to be a good one. 
I will, um, yes, let me just wrap up by saying thank you, mm -hmm. Frank. I mean, this is, it's an honor for me that you said yes to be a part of this. Um, if, if anyone is interested, um, I've got books out there, and I'll sign it. And of course, Frank, hopefully, you stick around a little bit if you. Well, have let me let me let them. me congratulate you on your book. Oh well, thank you. Because thank that, you. that is uh, they're not easy to do. Yeah. And, but as you know, you wrote uh, your own. And, and and to be able to do them well with pictures and research, I mean, uh, it, it's, it's it's commendable. And, well, it was an honor to learn more uh, about you and to write your story as well. So. I, I'm just glad you're such a great fan. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, thank you both. Thank you both for being here, and thank you all for coming tonight. And don't forget to validate your parking across from the elevators. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Frank, thank you. No, no. That, was, that was so much fun. I had a blast. I appreciate it.